four day. Um, this is the file that that there is um, ready for you guys to use, and um, you 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 would have seen that um, on Moodle last week. I did a really really quick video of how I made it and how there is a, a lot of mistake making and just going is this right is this right is this right is this right and um, it, it's not that I actually took a screen video and spread it up by a million percent um, it, instead I um, made a little script um, which I can share with you guys uh, which takes a screenshot every number of seconds and sticks it in a particular folder so that means um, if you're thinking about those of us and are we all in the third year no there's, there's um, one who isn't but those of us in the third year if you ever wanted to do it, there's two of us who aren't um, ever wanted to do a, a, a stop motion kind of here's how I make something in a computer this this script is is quite helpful for that and it's fiendishly simple and you should be able to run it on any Mac so if you've got a PC at home might not be as useful but I bet there would be a shell script that would um, do a very similar thing anyway uh, Wait, so it's just code that Tells. So just code. There it is. That's what it is. Oh, man. So set a folder. How many times you want to take a screen grab? How many seconds between your screen grabs? Um, and my, my comments are a little out now. And then when I want it to work, let's say I'm going to set a folder called four and um, what's, what's three hours divided into amounts of 20 seconds? Um, so that's um, 180 times um, three. What's 18 times three? 36, five. Yeah, that should do it. 180. Too early in the mass, 540. I was, I was, I was getting there. So, um, 20 seconds, if I make that 540 times um, and I start recording, then I'd be doing the secondary thing. But I'm already recording the screen, so why do something twice when people are only going to watch it once? Uh, let's put that back to bed. So uh, here, here's, here's my scene. Um, to, to touch briefly on your modelling question, once I've, once I've broken something apart, um, how, can I, how can I smooth it? And, and, and that's a really, really good question. Um, I'll, I'll just come over to another file. Um, and um, I've been working on my 3D robot that I want to um, run through the printer. Um, there it is there. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit later. Um, in fact, I'll just close off that file because, as as you can see, it is quite a few triangles involved in there. And um, although everything we're doing is quads, all four-sided polygons, um, 3D printers, when you make an STL file, it, it converts your um, one square into two triangles. Squares are better in, in terms of motion graphic practice and general animation um, let's just come to yeah let's come to this file here which is you know from last week uh, if if I just delete um, everything except except this cube here so I, I have this and my my process to smooth it out is to get my um, subdivision surface um, process and if I get that and I push it into there this is what my smooth surface looks like and is that a nice rounded corner um, cube 
no, the, the, you know, it, it really, really isn't. So it's been, it, it's not like it's been smoothed, it's like it's been oversimplified. Now, that idea of simplification is, is really critical to us um, for this. And the form of simplification that we're seeing is that there's not enough data to make it the smooth thing that we really like to see. And that, if I use the Q key, um, I, I go back to the pre-subdivision um, and now press Q again, I get post-subdivision. What, what, what's going on here is that I need to um, create a, a few more edge details. And this is what, this is kind of close to the problem that you're having, Felix. Um, the way that I do that is, well, first of all, I'm going to get my cube and I'm going to make it editable, so dealing dealing with that, so there's, there's no road back now. But if, if I come to the edges of my, of my cube object, um, you see how I've got a few extra tools there? Um, what I'd like to take a, a small but very important sidetrack on is if I come to Window and I come to Customization, and there's this option of customize commands. So coming to customize commands, I'm going to tick on edit palettes. Editing palettes allows me to now look for a um, particular tool. So let's say one tool that we use a lot is, well, that I use a lot, is um, a ring selection. So this this thing here so instead of having to go up and grab that and you know you guys have been using the mesh tools quite a bit now and just going menu mesh blah menu mesh blah it gets really tiresome so here's how you can think of now know through your own practice what you've been really preferring to use as your tools at the beginning so knowing that I use this I can now grab this wee fellow and I just push it up into there. So I've got loop selection, ring selection. I have bevel, I have extrude inner, I have extrude. I have um, line cut and I have loop path cut. So, you know, cutting, surfacing, selecting. And, and these, these are a, a, a nice little group to have. So I'm going to stop my filtering and we see that we have this thing called an icon separator and a group separator in a fill space. So if I get my group, actually I'm going to get my icon separator and I'm just going to drag one in there. And now I have a nice little visual break between the two. You know, you can see how things are being worked. You can have a whole new row of buttons wherever you want to choose them. You can put them all down there. You can have a row of buttons in there if you want. So as you start to grow with an ability and as soon as we start getting into the motion graphics tools particularly, you might want to create your own shelves and, and that's very easy. Um, let's let's get back on track so turning um, that off and I might come to um, saving my layout as well so save layout as and um, I could give this my name obviously that's not my name but you get the point and um, inside layouts there should be something called um, my name. Maybe I didn't click on the save button. But the process is that straightforward. Coming back to the topic. Um, I have my cube and now I'm going to insert loop path cuts. And this is what drives our, um, the appearance of our smoothing. So if I get this and if I put a edge along there now I want to put two edges in because I want I want one here as well so if I throw one in it's telling me that it's about 10% of the way and you can see how instantly my object has become better and, and still smooth um,
doing that, I have, if I, if I just stay here for a second, if I click on the plus tool, um, we see that it's evenly distributed them. But I could say that I want one at, I'll just hold my, well, I, I'm not getting to that whole number. So, you know, I'll just, I'll just type it in. That's at 10%. Um, this one's going to be at 90%. And, you know, I could add another one too, if, if I wanted, but I don't. You, you can see I now have something that would be great if I was animating a dancing, happy, smiling pill for some kind of um, uh, medicine company. You know, if we start thinking about the things we see on TV, which are really considered motion graphic practice, character development clearly is one of them. I'll come now and I'm going to do the same thing in this parameter. So I'm going to add an, another cut. I'm going to have two of them and I don't need to go so slow this time. So 10% um, and 90%. Come on, get to there and pow, suddenly it becomes a much smoother um, let's come to there and let's get two of those and now it's just you know should be muscle memory it's an it's an automated kind of action uh, let's come to there and there is a nicely rounded cube um, well rectangle however if I'm doing something with an object and let's just um, break that apart and I will try to move it there we go um, there are a few other tools available to me uh, if for some reason and I've been talking about this idea of box modeling and if I was modeling even a, a human skull or a cartoon mouse head or some kind of thing, it always start with a cube. And the question is, well, that, that seems highly bizarre. Why don't I start with a sphere? Well, a sphere is, is kind of problematic because the cube, the faces are all nice and evenly spaced. They're all just big squares. However, if, if we look at a sphere, we, we have this issue with the poles where, you know, nice square, nice square, nice square, but then they become triangles and that leads to pinching and really, really weird behaviors with, with our model. Um, I can, of course, look at the type and go for an icosahedron, which, which makes life, uh, which gets rid of that problem and it still renders smooth. <coughs> Let's get a quick render. Okay, yes. But it's all triangles and it's not as friendly to work with. However, making a square, a cube into a sphere. If I select a face, all right, that was easy. If I go to my select menu um, and there is something for selecting all the faces. So let's just flip that around. Yes, the old man isn't fibbing yet. You know he will today though. Um, if I right mouse click on that, and I come down to subdivide. So it, it is <coughs> like that, but it is not that. There's, there's no um, um, generator that I plug into and can set the settings. If I just come to subdivide and I turn on the little choose the cog wheel, um, this rather simple looking interface, um, one subdivision, and I turn on smooth subdivisions. Maximum angle means that I will look at things right up to a 180 degree bend. So if I limit it this to 135 degrees, it means that things that had sharp undercuts wouldn't get this smoothing out done to them. If I click on OK, it makes quite a good job. And, and this, could easily 
become the start. You know, it, it, it is like that, but I've got square faces and I've got very, very, uh, I've got a low amount of data. I can still use the cuts to bring in more surfaces and to pump it up where I need to, or, or else to um, quite prove the point if I come to subdivide and I click on the gear one more time and I'll go for um, two subdivisions and I click on OK. There's a sphere made out of squares that used to be a cube. Um, it, it still has um, artifacts of corners because you, you will see that if I do a, um, a loop selection um, or if I do a, hang on, let's get away from faces. There we go. If I do a ring selection, see, there's, there's where <coughs> the side of the cube used to be, but I can get rings. So there's, there is only practice that helps to drive these things. The, yes? So is it only... Is it only possible if you able to create a cube and then make it to a sphere that you can see all the sections? Um, so if I create only, I don't make a cube, I make a sphere. Yeah. Will it show like that or it won't? Um, it, well, here's a sphere that I've created, right? Uh -huh. um, so if, if I select this um, so yeah this one's made out of triangles but you know you have the option to choose tetrahedrons um, if I go for standard we, we get this kind of you know it, it's great for making a it, it looks quite death star like you know really primitive Star Wars malarkey but it, it's it's the polar regions that are really an issue with, with this model and that's what we're trying to avoid. We want to get um, a sense of what what is known as a, a platonicness to, to the solid and that it's the same shape that's going around the whole surface which, which makes for less problems in the long run and um, problems will find you um, but there's, you know, as I'm as I have been developing my skills, you know, there are really simple ways of, well, we move that and re rejoin it and it make, makes things better. But, um, so you're avoiding problems before you even get to Yeah, um, but is, isn't that life in dealing with people? You know, we, we learn through, oh shit, I did that wrong, must edit that out, um, and, and we try not to do that. So our, our polygons are people to us. We, we treat them nicely, we treat them like little kids, and hopefully they don't run away on us and, and make us cry. Uh, no, that's a little glimpse into parenting. Don't worry, it'll happen to you in about 20 years. Um, <clears throat> so, let, let's talk about today. D Felix, does that illuminate in any way for you? Does that still not answer the question? Okay. Well, I will, I will talk to you. Uh, okay, all right, sure. Who says I ever get a break? Um, coming, coming, coming to my scene. Um, the most, the most detailed part of the, of the modelling that that happened in here. Um, I, I made the shelf by using those tools from last week. So I have um, a cloner which is producing two copies of the shelf. Where, where is, where, oh no, I'm using a cloner that's just creating my number of shelves. So am I lying? No, there we go. I, I really don't want a shelf that high. Pardon me. Um, and then that has the single shelf um, module, the, um, Cloner number two is again a shelf and then I have another cloner that's um, making all the legs for me. When, when we have lots of little wee bits all over the shop, um, 
it's good to collect these pieces up so uh, oh no that's my table so cloner one two and three and I, I know there's a menu item for it but I can't I don't know where it is because um, we know how to group something in Illustrator right what's the shortcut for that uh, comment G. yeah so in Cinema 4D it's only a little bit different it's option G and so when we group things it creates a thing called a null which which just means all those of us that have used After Effects know what nulls are um, this is a lot more like a group so I will just call this um, book shelf super um, and just to make sure that I have got everything let's just hide it for a second yes that has all popped back um, the most complicated piece of modeling that I have done um, for this is a really quick representation of Eileen Gray's um, side table that she made for the building E1027 or 1024 um, if I come to here so I was just no I was just looking at a simple photographic reference and going all right um, this looks like this would fit in this kind of room because it's going to be filled with books and etc um, you'll see also that I've gone the little extra detail of putting skirting boards into my world and um, when I give it a quick render you see it, it catches shadow for me quite nicely and it, it adds to the reality of the scene now um, this door plate issue needs needs a bit of work that's still sitting um, too close to um, disappointing for me but thinking about how I got these really exacting um, joins for my metal work because uh, you know you see it, it, it is doing that um, that is no more difficult than what we have already established if I um, make myself a tube um, a cylinder I should say not a tube although I could use a tube as well uh, let's just get that a touch smaller and if I come to a front view and let's just make that editable straight away I'm going to go for something that has only um, one no it's going to have no height segments so it's just a circle extruding to a circle um, I might go for 32 rotation segments so um, it is really really smooth um, now that I've done that let, let's come back to here and the trick is super simple I get this and I make it editable I'm coming to my edges and I'm using my knife tool I'm making sure that with my knife tool I'm turning that off because I want to we're, we're only seeing one face of a three-dimensional object so visible only means only what you can see but I want to go right through it like a samurai um, so slice mode cut single line that doesn't really matter um, so I'm going to start and I hold my finger down on the shift key just like Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign I get a 45 degree um, snapping and I hit the return key that means now uh, the line keeps going but I'm not letting that ruin my day I'm going to come to my selection tool and I'm going to select the faces and I select those and delete them again the live selection tool it has this um, option of um, only what I see 
um, I know it's there somewhere. Oh, select only visible elements. So I, that means I just, I've selected those faces once and I've cut them and now I see the bits behind that I couldn't see before and now they're gone too. The rest of it is, instead of just using our live selection tool, I'm using rectangular selection and going to points because I still have the cap left over. Somebody left the cap out and um, I will just get rid of that and that's gone. And I'm going to select all those points where the cut's been made. And just by using the move tool and holding down my finger on the command key because I'm just getting those points and I'm extruding them. Brr, oh, hang on a minute. Maybe I need to be um, in my... No, I should still be in that mode. Maybe I need to be just in selection. And I hold down command. It, it, it was working when you guys weren't looking at me. I, 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 I promise. I promise. Um, maybe I'm not going to use points instead. I'm going to go to my edges. So in, in this case, um, and I yeah, there feels to be something a bit more logical to that. Um, I'll make a, no, that's not working for me. So I'll try my loop. There we go. So now I've got that that edge. Let's let's do this one more time. If I move from there, hold down the command key, and I drag out and look at that. I just have a really beautifully welded piece of furniture pipe. Now, obviously here, let's 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 come to here. So if you wanted to. Um, 3D model your own bicycle um, would be very very um, um, easy but this is this is a problem right we might want it to be a, a nice straight edge um, the way that I get around that is um, really quite graceful if I get a selection around those points the problem with them is that they're all at an angle now if I think about that and in another context it's like their x scale in space is all different so therefore if i get the scale tool and i move only the x scale so let's just rotate around a bit more and if i start to do that it makes my face flat so um, I'm now holding my finger on the shift key and so exactly 0% means that we have really good extruded tube that is still only one cylinder. Nice. Um, if I wanted to put a cap on this, I would um, start maybe using a bridging process or I there are tools that allow me just to fill a face up but we're not talking about modeling we're talking about texturing I promise what is it 40 minutes and I still haven't said a damn thing um, so thinking about first things first now if you've downloaded this file you'll see that there are um, a few textures already created and there's one here called um, mat number two if I double click on that you, you see that it has um, the um, surface um, of it that it's a, it's a, it's a JPEG um, and it's a um, quite a nice Persian carpet I'd, I'd like to own one day when I'm growing up um, and I probably got that from um oh, there we go so I, I just i just went and stole it off the internet that thing that you know tutors say never do um that that's kind of that's kind of good as well um so i save the image 
What about the edges? Yeah, the, the edges kind of worry me a bit too. Um, but there's things that I could do to it and um, like if, if I if I get it as a PNG with a transparent edge that transparency comes through or if I do the if I'm really going to zoom up if I'm taking my camera quite close to it I'd probably want to turn the file into a TIFF so it's higher resolution um, so let's just call this carpet 2 and again it's going into my week 3 folder so trying to stay tidy and um, let's close that to make a new texture all you got to do is you double click in, in the blank area so I'll just do that one more time see there's nothing around here this is my texturing area I double click and it's it, and it just makes a new a, a new texture for me you, you can go through the create and um, wherever it is. Uh, has anyone downloaded Cinema 4D for themselves at home yet? Yeah? Okay. So you might see something pop up saying extra content packs. Um, if you do that, it, it gives you um, a lot of materials that you can already use but again this is this is like shopping at the warehouse um you you're getting the same things as everybody else i mean and that's fine there's nothing wrong with being uniform um but you can make these yourself but downloading that content is a wise decision because it allows you to see how things are being made by pull, pulling them apart you know that thing that all young boys do two days after Christmas all the toys are broken I wanted to know how it worked um, I've made a blank material so if I double click on that um, mm, that shouldn't be there uh, let me just come to no you really should not be there is it my program's being a little bit weird. Um, can I remove that so you get... Ah, here we go. Let's just... I'm just going to take that out. There we go. Um, so this is roughly what you get at the very beginning. Um, so we have all these different... And, and the way that they're referred to as nodes um, that drive what our shader is doing so we, we put into our shader um, things called textures the same way that you put pigment into paint paints just opaque goopy stuff but I need to color it red for it to be red paint um, here with with color if I op open that up um, we see that I have with my um, HSV value. Can I just clear that? No, cancel. No, I'm just stuck with that. Um, so with HSV, I can choose to um, mix up a particular color. You, you can use RGB colors as well, um, but um, HSV can be can get to it results quicker it's just simply because all right I like that I just need to make it darker instead of mixing all three um, sliders at the same time but for me because I'm making a, a, a I'm using a bitmap here um, I have this option of adding a texture now that means that I'm clicking on these little three dots here. So if I click on that and it's going to ask me where the file is, let's just check. Yep, that's the right file. I'm clicking on open and suddenly now my material shader has that thing wrapped around it like a um, Christmas present. If I want to apply that to my surface 
which is this thing here called carpet. So it's a perfectly grey square on another perfect grey square, so it's really hard to see. I've got two ways to do it. The first, I get the material and I drag it onto its name in, inside my um, list of objects. Or I could just get it and I could drop it onto um, a thing. Now, I don't want a carpeted door. I, I'm, I'm not that kind of person. Uh, if, if I render now, now you see that mine's doing something quite weird, but see how it's looking reddish around there? What, what, I've got the com what I've got the computer to do is to look at how light is hitting surfaces and bouncing off. So yeah, I, I do have this, this issue here that I, I should not be happy with one, one part. Um, if I bring my um, JPEG open, um, I would really like to edit it. Uh, and when I do, I can just choose to reload the image. However, at the moment, I'm going to, um, I'm clicking on this button on the other side and I'm choosing to clear it. So, um, and it has now um, gone to this default color that I had pre-mixed. So when I put a texture into my shader, it overrides the color that was already there. So now I have this, this thing. Um, maybe I don't want a green carpet. Maybe I want to go for something that's um, perhaps a bit more contemporary and a form of uh, bright orange. That's more of an ochre. There we go. So when I render now, it's going to... So you see how orange light is being calculated as bouncing around the room. Like the the bottom of the yeah, yeah, if we got the camera underneath here, there, there, there can be these subtleties. Now, you guys won't be getting this yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, so, and you see that my Mac, it just turns the shape, uh, the rendering off pretty, pretty quickly. So let, let's just, let's just keep with this for a second um, and go through some of the other options. Um, luminance means that the thing is glowing within itself. It, it, it's, its material is a light form. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I turn that on, it, it suddenly pops out to being white because luminance overrides color. And when I make, when I turn luminance on, the <coughs> color that's happening is white so let, let's let's go back to where we were and in my scene I have quite a few lights set up so I'm going to turn all the lights off and we'll see this going on now Ooh, yeah 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 we can get pretty really quickly until it renders but you can see actually maybe um, yeah, yeah, a portal has opened into another dimension. Uh, Does the carpet become a light yes, the Yes, it's become a luminant item, so it, it makes light. Um, and it, you can use that luminance, as you can see behind the armchair, there's kind of a little bit of shadowing going on, like you can definitely see the projected upward shadow of the um, lampshade. Makes sense? So why do you like light? What in this room is glowing? Sure. Yep. So it's good for that, but if you also look at the way that light's handling it, working in this room, outside of this room there's light coming through, so it's better in this sort of thing to use um, um, area lights because light can do many many things like 
who's who's always who who of us has not marvelled at the way that light comes through clouds after the rain at sunset and we get those fingers of light coming through we can't we can't manage that or if we think about the way that in almost every science fiction film we have seen or are yet to see all the ship's engines have that blue kind of glow coming out of them so glows sun rays um, it's a good question and what you're saying has a real validity in one industry and it's the gaming industry because when you're running around um, wherever with the whatever it is in your hand the world's brightly lit and that's because all the shaders have their own little amount of luminance adding to that world so it's knowing when to use the tool at the right time but I must admit that shelf is looking pretty cool right now. Um, so that's what that's what luminance does. Uh, I'll I'll just turn that off and I'll go back down. Um, ref, reflect. Oh, sorry, George. Oh, I'm just wondering, like, what you said, luminance like override the the tolerance. Yeah. Um, when you say luminance, for example, the projection on a wall is a light source. It have image. Context in it. Yeah. So if you want to make it into 4D, yeah. would it be a moving object? Yeah. Yeah. How do you make sure that the light doesn't just override the context? Um, you can, when we get to lighting, you can tell the lights you don't touch the subject. Right. You can work on all these objects, but not that one there. So, say for example, um, the computers in this room so we've got quite a dim ambient light going on and we want the light to come out from the screen and not be washed out let's say if the lights were on we don't want the screens to be washed out right so the same kind of idea um, I can tell the light source don't touch these polygons so I can give it an exclusion list and and therefore the light would be calculated correctly and of course the lights are not just off and on the lights are zero to any number and 100 is expected to be full color but you can go up to um, hundreds if not thousands so you can push beyond normal understandings because if you're using say a really deep blue light going up to 100 might not be bright enough so you can push it beyond Reflectance is um, shininess and we, we can see here that this is kind of a bit like a dirty old bowling ball at the moment. It certainly isn't high, a high chromed surface. Um, the way that we get to shininess as quick as possible is that we look at this thing called type. Um, and um, we all know that I love type, but it's the word in the other sense. Um, and we have different reflectivity um, mathematical models. And um, all of these are named, except for um, CGX, are named after the mathematicians who, um, who yes, yes, there was a Mr. Fong. Um, Fong is one of the oldest reflective models, um, but I, I, it, it still works very, very nicely. And we see that when I went from Fong to, um, um, let's go to Blin Legacy, we, we see that we get this thing, which looks like our Photoshop histogram, and that's telling me how much... Um, reflectivity is going on so going back to Fong it's really quite narrow so it's just going to be a hot spot but it goes to really high levels of um, reflectiveness so if I come to here and just change my angle a bit and I render So it's just calculating the, the 
ambient light. Oh, hang on, wait, I turned all my oh, lights off. Light. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, senior moment. Let's, <laughs> let, let's turn those on. I'm old, I'm allowed to say that. Um, let, let's render one more time. But Fong is also a tool, right? It's not just a... Um, it, it, it's one of those little wee switches there. And why am I not getting reflection? I think you have two different lights. Uh, light. Uh, let's just turn... Maybe it's not directly projecting to the top. Uh, no, it... it, it it's it shouldn't be driven it isn't driven by that um let's go and yes that is fine i will add a fong layer that's maybe what i had done wrong so let's let's quickly go back to that so there is the default specularity which is the shininess i i hadn't quite looked at making reflection yet so I've come to reflectance and I'm adding a fong layer and then suddenly it looks like I've got this out, outdoor scene happening and, and that's because reflections need a reflection map and mapping is a little bit too advanced for what we need to understand for today but um, if I had for example a ceiling in my space I would get that happening as soon as I render let's just come come to here you know you can see the outdoors you know if you ever look at um, illustrations of people drawing chromey things there's always that kind of hills and sky thing even though there's no hills and sky we've just developed this Is that just the default reflection? yeah it's just yeah it, it's but if we have a look here we can see that i now have a super 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 shiny um surface and that I have um, I have these drivers that uh, I have this roughness and reflection strength and specular strength sadly it just jumps straight out of it um, and bump strength so if I get my um, roughness down to zero oh look at that it's now polished mirror so one more time with the render um, and you can see even with the light calculations there's like a, a perfect bounce back is it possible to render just like one cube instead of having to like the whole thing yes would everyone be happier with that instead of seeing what it does to the whole scene oh it's just Oh yeah, for personal practice, um, absolutely, and it actually raises a really good question. And that, let's say that I have built my whole scene, and I just want to focus on one thing. Um, if I come to here, if I come to um, table, table number two, I click on these three buttons here, allow me to just focus on a particular thing the top button allows me to turn the whole world back on so um, I'm going to get um, all these pieces and I'm going to solo those because I could actually just drop that shader on the whole damn group and if I render that oh it's going to render the whole damn scene son of a um, I could turn everything else off I could probably say that I'm only going to 
render out of that as well but you know it, it's starting to look quite deco and interesting uh let's let's just crash out of that uh there is however one further feature which i should mention so if i bring it all back on if i come to my render menu we have um instead of rendering the whole view which is what i've been doing you could render a particular region or and this is probably going to save um, get to the issue you're curious about is just rendering only the active objects but with render region and um, we have a live version of that which means that if I go to interactive render region so that means that I can click a particular area and every time I get my material and I make a change so we're not going to have reflectance we're going to have color it recalculates that that little portion for me so I can be tuning and watching instead of because this is only a few seconds per render sometimes it can be a couple of hours per render and that's when um, hand -ins only a day away and things are hitting the red line and we want to just I just want to see this one little bit so uh, to get rid of it once again um, you just select it and it, it, it pops off okay I, I will stop talking I promise I'll, I'll let you guys do some texturing um, so bringing um, that back on fog we're not going to worry about fog materials today um, however a, a bitmap a, a bump map I should say um, if I put a texture on an object and I don't want it we come over to our project view and I select that material and I just delete it um, this area is called tags and um, from next week onwards we really start diving into the tag area uh, with um, Christian yesterday we started looking at dynamics tags in the studio and how we can see how things can collide instead of working off animations of making things move it's actually using real physics which is a lot of fun great part of um, motion graphic um, practice as we're going to explore it however coming coming back to the idea of a bump um, and this introduces two ideas at once first if I turn a bump on um, nothing nothing will seem to happen so let me just zoom up for a sec and I am going to change I'm turning off this thing that I've added called global illumination um, these are my render settings uh, hey 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 let's turn you off because if I render now okay it's a, it's a lot faster so this is but the color isn't as good either so you know quality comes at a price always has always will if I come back to bump bump is asking me for something I've got no controls whatsoever and it's asking for a thing called a texture now I could load a file because say for example um, if I said if I wanted it to feel like human skin human skin bump map hey get back here so it's 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 a black and white file bump maps are black and white files and, and what it reads is white values through to black values and the more something moves to white the higher the surface becomes so for example if I wanted my um, carpet to feel like the moon moon bump map
and if I um, save this we don't have to use the internet but this is just you son of a bitch um, edit that out um, save image as trim to chunk yep that'll do and of course we could use real NASA photographs which would be way more authentic but if I come to here I can load an image and look at that it suddenly got bumpy and if I render now there's the moon on the carpet in the room it only works on black and white color has no value to it in fact if you put a color um, image in you'd probably get not as good a bump however I'm, go I'm going to clear that I'm going to get rid of that because the second thing that I want that this introduces to you is that when we click on the texture tab we we have all these things that we can put in so um, this is like the relationship that we have in After Effects to say um, the notion of a composition you can put a composition and a composition and a composition and a composition and it's um, iterative and in infinite you can just keep doing it with a node you can you can attach a node to a node and another node to that they become links in a chain what what this means is that this texture channel as we call it we can add a gradient node so um, if I add a gradient it's going to go from white to black so my image will slowly do that or I could have lots of knots so I've added a gradient it, this has no logic to it um, but I could say that I'm going to have a point there and this color will be black and another point here to it and this color will be white and another point here with this color being black and it's like oh okay well that's that's probably going to um, generate some form of bump but it's, it's not going to be a very very interesting form of bump um, I'm now inside the work area of the of the gradient how do I get back to my shader please well that's what these little navigating arrows are for so I'll just go back and I'll just go back so now I'm back into the bump world if I go forward I'm into the gradient but I'm going to clear that I don't I don't want that instead what's better for making things to appear bumpy is that and um, this is where Cinema 4D totally owns Maya and that the noise generator so if I get noise and you can see a little thing happened but if I click on the noise icon here's all the parameters for making noise and you know if you wanted to have um, make marble or give things kind of dinosaur skin you know how notice how when you're a kid dinosaurs were all kind of gray but now they're purple and stripy with bits of yellow it's like you know the time travelers are really doing a better job with their watercolors these days but if you wanted that kind of freaky lizard sort of coloring because you've got color one and you've got color two um, we're dealing with a bump map so it just means it's going to stay black and white but the noise machine is just called noise however we have a lot of noise um, um, well again this is all mathematics these are all um, mathematicians who have spent their PhDs writing a new algorithm on how to how to make noise so when we see Luca and um, Naki and Ober the these are dudes or dudettes um, but for example if I wanted it to feel like an ocean texture I could say I want wavy turbulence um, octaves means the kind of scale so if I say um, there's going to be 
Oh uh, no, that's to do with the intensity of the colours. Eight octaves. What I'm should be looking at is um, the idea of global scale. So if I make it too big or if I make it really, really tiny, you, you can see I, I'm getting more of it. Um, you can see this is an easy way to make a planet for something to do with um, science fiction. Um, I have my X, Y, Z scale as well. Um, and we see that we have this thing called animation speed too. So if I make it say 0 0.1 and I right mouse click and I animate, we will see that it, it is actually, you know, it did actually change around. So as I go through my timeline, so the texture would start to ripple. And this is one way we can make ocean waves out of a, out of a single um, um, polygon plane. Let, let's see what this renders like. I mean, I'm, I'm just being virtual again. Yeah? So how do I make things feel like plaster stucco? How do I make something feel like the grip tread of a skateboard? How can I get um, wrinkly old man skin? Well, just need to hang around on the planet for a while for that. But, you know, if we start to feel how everything does have a texture, we can use bump maps quite subtly. Um, bump maps obviously don't work with reflections because that's just not how the world is. You got to have something really polished and shiny. Um, so th there is there is a lot to look at here. Um, the high clip and low clip um, drives our um, our contrast. So it doesn't need to be just shades of grey. You can really smash it to make it just black and white. And then maybe it looks more like a, um, a, a harder kind of texture, yeah? So it's either off or it's on. It isn't a whole bunch of variances between the two. Okay, that's bump maps. Um, uh, electrics, pretty cool. Let's, um, if you're messing around, and you really should be, you know, this is play school. So get, get your hands in the paint and really wiggle them around. Um, if you get to really messing up all your out of the box settings and you're going, uh, do I have to close the program and open it again? Do I have to delete this and start over? The ob obvious answer is no. If you right mouse click on low clip, you can just say reset to default. That counts for everything. Right? That, yes, exactly. And that's how you can master all software instantly find the big pattern and realize it applies to everything very little is contextual when it comes to software um, so i've reset everything and so i'm actually back to noise again um, if i want gaseous i'll eat capsicums um, anyway turning that off and then the last one, um, Alpha allows, whoops, I'll just turn animate off. Um, alpha allows me to poke holes in things. So it, it, it treats a polygon like a PNG. That's, that's the easiest way to put it. So for example, if I add a um, noise here, and I'm, oh, hang on. Alpha, I gotta turn it on too. See how it suddenly got partial transparency going on. So if if I was making um, Marlowe's ghost out of um, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, then you know it could all be um, even. And because I can animate this, it could be like some kind of really spectral fading in and out character um, texture. So noise, and I'm gonna come to that, and if I get, I'm just gonna play with those clipping values again. And, let 
more holes please there we go so if I render this now I need to do something with my render to read those alpha values and to actually poke holes right through but again you know animating it it suddenly gets really quite quite freaky um, and if you ever do have things that are a big problem if you just go C4D alpha not working in render alpha not showing in render well there's how many vi there's over half a million answers um, the Cinema 4D community is, is large and noisy on the internet and you can just find out so much. Finally though, displacement. What, what Alpha Channel does, it only does it via appearance. It only makes it look like it's bumpy. So for example, if I turn my, oh sorry, wrong one. If I turn my bump back on and you know how, see how it keeps all those settings. If I come to really flat, and I've only been talking an hour, great. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully, I've, I'm still recording this. If I turn the grid off, there we go. So it, it does look like it's bumpy until I come really, really close. No, it looks like it's bumpy. It isn't actually bumpy whatsoever. However, um, displacement on the other hand let's turn that off and again I'm using sure I'll do that and I'm going to once again um, go with a noise notice how the shape changes radically on my sphere and and and, and this this is this is telling me a thing um, and I'm going to turn on sub polygon displacement because I've got subdivisions so let's try and make it high res 12 sub that's that's crazy talk man let's go back to six and um, I should with be able to there it is the displacement height and the strength so if I get the height up to because this is a, a world of centimeters and let's just turn that and I should get something kind of grotesque and ugly and I, I wouldn't be too surprised by that but and as you can see I've, I've quite radically remodeled what the polygons doing I, I can't see it while I'm in this world but I'm definitely um, making it a very strange shape. So let's, let's just stop that for a second and I'll get the height down to like mm, five centimeters and render one more time. So if I was going over a vast expanse, I needed to make a whole bunch of sand dunes it'd be very easy to do that or if I was making a low poly world of a planet that has an ocean I'd have one sphere that's blue and then I'd have another sphere that's green that's inside it and then I'd put a displacement map because it would poke all the little islands out all right um, that's texturing and a pretty big nut I can't say it's in a nutshell I've been talking for quite a bit um, but that really explains how we can put surfaces textures and surfaces and apply them to our polygons and now you can just be rendering and um, I'll give you guys what 20 minutes is that enough time for some exploration I need to go get a cup of coffee because um, I was up um, till the early morning yet again 
and um, I'll be back in a couple of minutes if everyone's okay with that and then I'll be really more than happy to answer questions. Answer questions, or do I say ask? Answer. I need that coffee. All right. Oh, dude, yeah. Um, I can't remember the last time I had more than five hours any night. I know it's stupid, but... Um, okay. So, let me just do that one, last, one more time. If, if I click and hold on any menu or any tool set that has that little wee arrow saying that there's more stuff in there, if I just hang on to this little grip tab, um, it, it, pulls, it pulls that off. So as, as you can see, um, we have a collection of lights. We're not going to go through all of them because it means that I'd be talking for an, at least another hour or so. Um, I don't mind doing that, but I want you guys to be experimenting because this, this has a lot more visual complexity um, and opportunity than what we have with just texturing. Um, if I just, in, in my project view, I've turned all my current lights off, and as soon as I add a light, as long as in my display, um, in my options, I have, um, let's say I can turn shadows on, and I've got enhanced OpenGL running, um, I could turn on reflections as well if I wanted, but that means as soon as I add a light, my relationship of my shading in the space, it, it starts to get um, very um, interactive. So if, if I have a light here and I just hit my render button, there we go, and, and that's what I get. And we can see with lighting we get a better description of shape and form and and these lights um, they they have some really great um, behaviors to them so let me just keep that there and if I e expand this for a second so my light object it has a lot of parameters to it um, Basic is just the name of it and how it appears in my scene. The coordinates are its physical space, but as, as soon as we get to um, the general tab, the light doesn't need to be um, white. So, and again, you know what I was saying before, that if I made this a really, really deep blue color because that suddenly starts to make my scene look maybe a touch like nighttime. Um, I have this thing called intensity, so let's say that I make it 600% and now it starts to become its own strange thing. However, keeping as we are, since we're, we're just at the beginning of this, I will turn its visibility up to um, full value and zero saturation so again I'm getting my nice light um, if you wanted it if you're thinking about the emotional space of the work that you're creating um, if, if you want it to be a kind of happy space you might want to make your light slightly warm exactly you know, and or or that even kind of feels like old newspaper now. You know, it, it's getting a, a nostalgic feeling to it. However, if we're in winter and things are um, colder, then if what's that? Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Oh, don't mention hospitals. <laughs> um, um, then I can cool the light down now. We also, uh, who, who has ever had to buy a neon tube for anything? Anyone? I know, stupid question. Um, but when, when, you, um, when you buy certain types of light, they ask for a colour temperature. 
or if you've been noticing um, the advanced light settings in our digital SLRs, you can set a thing called a Kelvin point for your white light. Um, Kelvin is the measurement of temperature that works, um, well it's the scientific measurement, so um, zero Kelvin is the temperature of outer space, which is about negative 231 degrees Celsius or something, pretty bloody freezing. Um, but that goes from the void hard vacuum of some bits of space um, to once it gets hot enough it starts to become light values as well. So if I use a, a colour temperature, um, 6,500, ah, who's bought an LED light bulb for their house? No one? One, two, okay. So it talks about warm light and cool light, right? So that's that's the Kelvin one's, scale. One's yellow, one's kind of... Like Bluey. Blue yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so one has a value of um, 6,500, the other one has a value of 3,200. So, and that's what color temperature does. So there, there we go, there's, there's warm light, there's cool light. So we can, we can mess around with that, but I shan't. Let's just go back to, um, again, right mouse click. So, excuse me. Yes. So um, I got a, one LED light that mm. have both warm and cold lighting together. Yeah. So does it mean we can do something like here and then we can have two light and give it a little bit natural kind of lighting? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the intensity you've, you've seen me playing around with, and even though I've created this as what's called a, um, well, here it's called a light light. Um, I know it as a point light from other um, applications, but um, the program calls it itself the omnidirectional light, and, and that's what it is. It, it's like a light bulb. So therefore, if I get my light bulb, and let's put it over here, and I'm getting close to the corner. I, I could have done it a much better way, but you can see that as soon as I put it inside, let's let's get, yeah, okay, I got two of those in there. But when I render now, do, 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 do. It's, it's starting to have the light's not going everywhere, it's just spilling out the top and the bottom. So it does obey natural physical laws. However, there's more. Um, as soon as I get down to there, I have this thing called shadow. And there's three main types of shadows. Um, ray traced, which um, those of us that know about gaming, that means reflections and refractions and some forms of shadows that are really, really crisp. Um, and we have shadow maps, which are quite soft. So if I go for a soft shadow map to begin with, and we, we can see now that it actually is calculating darkness. Well, let's just move that out for a second because as soon as I start to move that around, you know, we can see how shadows are being generated. So let's come to here and I render that out. I get these, um, sorry, it did a reset again on me. I get those kind of, it looks, oh, well, it looks much better on the projector than it does on the screen. So when you guys are watching this at home, it's going to look a bit more crappier. Um, so if I come, if I just go with that, I need to come to my shadow tab. And shadow maps are governed by resolution. So the higher the quality you want, the bigger your sample size. And what we're really thinking about here is what's the size of my render? Well, I haven't set the size of my render at the moment, but I know that my screen is really no bigger than 2000 by 2000 pixels, and I'm not doing a full screen render. So let's say 1250 by 1250. Um, I render one more time, 
and I don't know if you guys can tell. Uh, yeah, that looks that looks much better. But the the density of shadows. If you ever notice your shadow um, during the day when you're on the grass or on the asphalt, it's not like your shadow totally obliterates all of everything underneath. They're, they're transparent. So this idea of density is maybe a little problematic. So if I take my density down to, let's say, 80% and I render again, you know, that's probably a bit more realistic. And we're now starting to get the feeling of something that's a little film noir. Um, opening up my sample radius, um, in increases the blur around my image so let's can I go further than that okay I can only go up to 20 but I'm I'm getting something that feels you know quite quite good quite late evening late afternoon um, back to my general so that's that shadow map soft um, ray traced shadows um, the really really super super crisp and that's the kind of shadows that would use for anything where light is going through a lens so um, as soon as we put a lens onto light yeah like some torches like the really nice mag lights you get a really crisp circle you don't get that blurry edge which is called the penumbra um, ray traced hard if I come to my shadows you see that we get um, less options but if we think about the way that some things are stylized you know we don't necessarily need to have um, black shadows we can have kind of interesting mauve shadows and so if we look at say for example um, if I say C4D um, text EXTA you know this 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 program could really be its own degree by itself um, yeah these are just you know you can see that maybe you're getting a little bit of colored uh, here we go C4D, let's go for a more targeted word, isometric text. Yeah, look at that. You know, there's a, there's a way that, you know, we could color things um, in, in here. Um, but you're not going to watch me go online shopping for images. That, that's not what an education is about. Coming back, let's just reset that. Um, reset to default there. Back to black. Dun 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 dun. And as well as ray traced hard, we have a thing called area, which is um, a, a bit more natural like um, there are shadows being generated through the light that's coming in through the window these secondary bounced off things um, light sources so that's where area light if we, if we look around where um, at the base of the bookshelf that actually did feel um, a lot more natural where you know this is this this does have a certain amount of artificiality to it so the question is really how how stylized are we and um, the intentions of how we're reflecting that through our, our software so let's just render that out and you know that 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 feels quite good um, as well as that we're still only on the first light um, I, I have the ability to if I have this thing here called visible light and that means that um, if I render this 
we can see it as a light so if you you know wanted to make a thing that has a light bulb and you see the light of the light bulb light up then that's how you do it our, our light is a is a physical thing so if i get um this wee chap and i stick it in there and i render one more time look there's there's light coming coming out and around now here's here's where we start to balance our ideas so i i have this material here and if if i drop this on and i'm just going to look at this material i think this is the one um, yeah, I've turned on luminance and it has a 60% value. It doesn't have to be a 100% value. Um, if I come to my render settings, I'm going to maybe turn on my global illumination. It will slow things down, but that's how I get a more accurate light calculation. And the way that you guys get this happening is you've got to come to the effect, which is um it's alphabetical order i hope um oh, maybe it's because i've already added it it's not on the list anymore so i'm not going to turn it on let's just have a quick render but but you see that the two things adding together so it's opposite of what you were proposing with the screen um but it actually getting that feeling that the light is working if if not even get this material and think about its uh, transparency so i'm turning its transparency on but the brightness of the transparency i don't want it this is how you make glass um, if i i want it just to be partially transparent um, refraction, refraction preset, total internal, Fresnel, that's fine. Um, and let's just go for that out of the box. And I render again. We can see the wireframe of what's holding the um, lampshade onto the lamp is starting to appear and so now this is okay so that's that's a little too much um so i'd be using my interactive renderer here to make sure that i'm getting that feeling that it is a semi-transparent material if if that's what i'm wanting to communicate of course um, i'll keep it pretty whole for the time being um, however so that's that's seeing the light as an object and maybe i should color that slightly orange as well just to help sell the trick you know these tools although they are amazing no one tool solves every problem it's not like a you know a, a, a magic screwdriver it's like okay well this is a light inside this thing this thing is slightly transparent i should maybe try to boost the communication through coloring my light the color of the lampshade as well as making the lampshade semi-luminant as as well uh, if if i come further along to one one other aspect of visible light um, i have the ability to um, make my light volumetric which means that it can behave a bit like fog and you know we're thinking about light fingering um, through clouds and all those things that that's what volumetric light is is doing so again if i render this and we're kind of not seeing the relationship here so i'm just going to break out to a new file and i will create um, a similar aspect so I'm coming to my light and um, in the visible light it's going to be volumetric and this is this is the size of the volume if I come to um, a sphere 
and I'm just going to put that there and you know kind of like Death Star once again oh now you saw it there for a second let's just do that one more time see that uh, hang on James. see how there's a shadow coming off there or come and have a look at my screen before it clicks off you'll see that it, 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 it's really quite beautiful oh it's much better here yeah yeah, yeah. projectors are, are, yeah own, only just but but there so that's what mm -hmm. you know so you're wanting to do something underwater oh. you're wanting to do something um, in a spooky environment you're wanting to do something late at night you wanting to do something in outer space um, you're wanting to make that kind of rocket engine it just has that weird blue glow this is how you do it all right back to you back to your seats <laughs> so not not difficult although they are still special effects so those are the basic parameters of of most lights um, so in when, when I think of this you know that's going to that that has many commutative many transferable values if I say I go to a spotlight let, let's make one of those and if if I get this it's it's kind of a similar thing but it's only going in a set direction you notice that we have these kind of pointery gizmos so I can open up my angle and let's say if I rotate this come here you so I'm rotating it down 90 degrees and I am going to position that um, up you know it can become just like you know the kind of light that would expect in a room because there's there's, there's a lampshade kind of happening um, and all the same principles of um, let's just get that a little more like that there we go so now we can see that we do get that really I'll just move my frame up a touch and I'll just hide that for a second we do get that really nice darkening that happens in, in, in the corners of rooms um, there is um, there are a few other options um, with this in that um, I should be able to set let's just there we go set the blur area so again it, it could behave like a lens it could be really quite sharp if I um, oh and then there's the, I'm just going to go briefly today I won't try to disappear down um, any rabbit holes uh, the where does it have maybe it's inside my details it is so I have an inner angle and an outer angle so the inner angle says where is it going to be really really sharp and then the outer angle is where does it fade out to and so you can see when the two meet that's the feeling of it, the light going through a lens so um, someone wandering around the dark with a, with a flashlight you know you'd be you'd be using this kind of um, approach let's get my inner angle um, smaller and it is starting to fade out there um, ever so slightly we have 
at the moment um, a problem that exists outside the real world um, and that is the, this light is eternal so if, if I'm in, if I'm using cinema 4d on the planet planetoid Pluto at the moment and I shine it at you guys it's exactly as bright as it is in this room as it is on the on Pluto now that's not how light works um, otherwise you know nighttime would still be daytime because we'd be getting the sun would get him, be getting light from all those suns out there you know, there's trillions of trillions of them um, I went to the planetarium uh, a couple of weekends ago you know over 10 trillion stars in our in our Milky Way galaxy possibly another 10 trillion galaxies so there's you know a lot of universe out there however coming back to what I am talking about instead of light being eternal we have in the details this thing called fall off which means that um, I have um, this thing called linear or step but generally what we should be aiming for is the inverse square law which um, those of us that went through the joy and pleasure of studying physics at high school know that as something doubles its distance it loses three quarters of its strength now we know this with Photoshop Photoshop's a really good example of the inverse square law if I make an image that's a hundred pixels by a hundred pixels it might be a hundred K in size just as an example but if I make my image 200 pixels by 200 pixels the image size goes up to 400k because it's the the idea of things being squared but squared somehow inversely so in other words as I double the distance away the light drops by a factor of four not a factor of two um, so here when I render you know that's starting to, to look quite realistic of a very dim colored light now I, I probably need to put a light bulb inside of here as well because that's not looking um, too realistic let's just get this and take the luminance out so now I have a more holistic scene okay kind of cool but if I get my light there it is and I drag it down we see that things do actually get much much brighter so you can get some very um, natural um, spooky feeling um, lights although we know that motion graphics is quite bright and bouncy um, and again with this with the um, in the general tool um, tab if I click on volumetric this time we do get something a little bit different um, in that I am going for yep volumetric and the the light volume itself that is this second skin that I can pull out so if I render this at its current moment we see that the the light volume only dropped down to to that amount so if I pull this light volume generator all the way down through the floor and I frame up and I render you know it's turning into quite a hazy wee scene then finally before I um, stop talking I can add noise to that volume of light so let's go for um, I can ha control whether I'm seeing the light or not or how bright the light is but let's go for the hamburger and the bun 
and um, get both and if I render can you see how there are shifts of density happening so that's why adding noise um, yeah 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 exactly it's how you it's how you'd have a, a foggy outdoors um, if you so wanted um, okay I'll uh, go to one more light which is quite different um, from uh, the two that we've been seeing because you can see that the um, the omni light and the um, the spotlight they they have very very similar um, properties uh, you, you you see that there is whoops a daisy um, Kalatha there is a thing called a target light which is a spotlight that will follow a particular object so for example if I come to that scene that I've set up just before um, I'll, I'll get whoops wrong thing I'll get the light and I'll kill that off if I create a target light we see at the moment we have um, my sphere so if I move that around yeah okay that that's to be expected but in the light itself there's a little wee bullseye thing and this is um, again the idea of what a tag is and I haven't really discussed that I've only spoken around it so let's select a tag and it's saying um, what's my um, target object here and at the moment it's only targeting itself so if I get the sphere and I drop that into the target object bang Click the drop down, the sphere's not there, right? No. Okay. No, it just gives me some other um, and now if I'm wherever I move my object. It's so similar to uh like Yes, it's like a form of parenting. Yeah. Um, however, I could say that I thinking about that parenting thing. Uh, let's um, anyone here um, ever got caught down the rabbit hole of looking at UFOs online and all the different types of UFOs when I was a kid I was fascinated by them I used to make my own fake UFO photography um, let's say that I'm going for one of the old school types of UFO called the cigar shaped UFO it's true look it up or don't because you start hearing about stupid things like lizard people and the royal family being from outer space and um, other such nonsense um, so this is my spaceship right um, if I get this light um, and I want now here's a really good way to understand why I would want to use my global um, setting instead of my local setting for my manipulator and let's just get that so this is the searchlight or the capturing beam or the whatever it is that's attached to my UFO now if, if I get my UFO and I'm wanting it to move around my scene it's like eh, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna move all that now I don't like that um, I can parent this to that and the target to that will still still be working so if I get the light and just as we were looking at yes um, not yesterday last week with um, generating shapes so this light becomes a child of the cylinder so whatever the parent says hey you come with me it's always going to be um, it's going to be following one object but looking at another so for example therefore if I get my sphere and I'm going to set a keyframe there and sometime later a um, keyframe over here so basic animation and then in my scene my object is going to be here basic, basic motion 
caveat, footnote, see details, that reverse the packet. Um, and over here, it's over there, keyframe. So it's not complicated animation, but we can see that I don't have to worry so much about what my finer details are doing. So this would render out quite accurately the whole way through. And again, this is one of the small benefits. You can do this in Maya, you can do this in other software, but just not as easily, not as straightforward um, and comprehensively simple. Um, back to here, the last light that I'm going to chat about and this gives us um, gives you guys 20 minutes for experimentation is um, this guy here which is called the area light and it, it's like light from outside so say I'm going to get one of these area lights and I'll just go to my four way view and oh that oh. The sound of knuckles cracking. If I put it behind my door, it, it's treating it's it's treating the square. And when you create a um, a light panel, they're not the size. But as you can tell, they, they can be um, manipulated. Um, to be the right size for you. So if I just have a look there, let's get that light panel. Which light panel is it? Okay, it is that one. Making making that visible. And I'll drag that down. So it's about the size of the hole and there. Let's just make that a bit taller here and there. Great. So that means now if I look at my scene, do I have any other light on? No. And making sure that I don't You know, there's there's the light coming through the crack of the door. Now, let's try that. So, quite quite um, interesting. And what, how I would use if I was setting this up to look like what those versions, what those um, um, examples I played, posted up last week are to look like. Uh, if I come back here and if I get it, I would have, um, well, I actually have created my setup for myself. So I would have a big flat light panel on each of those two surfaces um, like so and I would get here let's turn light 2 and light 1 on they are not both at a hundred percent and with light panels you can't have um, volumetric light you can um, you can only have this very, very um, flat stuff happening. I think it's in this program. Let me just check that. Um, yeah, visible light is, is, is not possible with these. Um, so, and this is, this is another reason why we don't just use luminant objects. We, we can't get light glows and we can't get volumetrics. Um, so both have an intensity of around 80%. So maybe I'll push one down quite a bit more and I, I render this out. 
and that's starting to look okay. Maybe if I take one up to, let's say, 90 and the other one 80, I'm probably, whoops, I often do that. That's the wrong square I'm clicking on. Uh, no, there isn't, but I wish there was, because it would be good if there was a little bit of a shadow forming around it, because it would feel um, a bit more real instead of like a fake 2D thing. Um, so I know I've kind of rushed through the last one, but it's time to look at your own scenes and start exploring with some lights. And I'll pause the recording. So I've downloaded this texture from polygon.com and it's included all these extra channels. These extra channels, so if I come to color, I'm going to choose a texture channel and just making sure that I'm going to the right place and regular 2K. Um, so here I have the color channel. So if I get that and I open it and I move it into my project, that's, that's what it looks like. But if, if I come now to the, um, let's say the reflectance channel, um, I can say that I'm going to add a um, Fong reflectance and I should be able to put in, I can't see where it's asking for a, um, a channel for that. I'll just turn that off for the meantime because what I can come down to is let's say the bump. If I turn on the bump channel it's asking for a texture that, that makes me a lot happier. So if I click on adding I'm, I'm looking for this thing here called the normal channel. Now if once our eyes have adjusted to that color you see how there's little wee lips there you know little wee lines that that adds the bump into exactly the same place where that texture is. So I'm going to open that and yes I'll accept that into my project. Um, if I bring open my displacement channel, you know some floorboards are slightly higher than others sometimes. So again let's see if there is, there's reflection, normal, there's gloss, there is um, a displacement and you see how there are subtle shades of grey there and um, I'm just going to go over the 16-bit image because there's more shades of grey in there so more subtlety. Um, also you know wood grain looks like wood grain but if you if you've experienced oak or walnut the grain is never perfectly flat that's how you build that in without modeling half a billion polygons. Um, I would like to get reflectance to work, color brightness R there. So turning that on and then in the layer color, you see it's all white, it's all right on. If I start to turn down the brightness, you see how the reflectivity starts to drop? Okay, so underneath that is a texture channel. If I now go for the um, gloss, see there's going to be different amounts of shininess to my floor so I'll open that up and now suddenly I'm, I'm getting to um, quite an interesting space and now I can start to um, decide to make that more or less um, reflective but I'll, I'll go with all out-of-the-box settings. So I've now made this very, very shiny material. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag and drop it onto my floor. Now, if I render now, it's, it's, it's a really, really polished wood floor. So... Um, looking at what's happening with 
with my textures. Um, I do need to talk about rendering, but let's say that with that wood floor, it's not happening enough times. It's, you know, it's big ship's planks, but it, it doesn't need to be. So looking at where my floor is, where is that in my project? There it is, floor. We see that with some of these things, we've got this thing that looks like a really, really small um, checkerboard. Um, if I come to material tags um, and that's not attaching itself yet, so that's okay, I'm not too worried. If I come here and I double click on the floor shader, well, single click at the moment, it's got this thing called um, UVW mapping and UVW is like XYZ so it's space but it's not space in space it's space on an object so UVW or actually W's through there um, so I could say that I, I, I can start to replicate how much of this is is going to be there so if I say that the length um, u and v is going to be 20 and 20 I, I now have more repetitions of the shader and so that when I render now now these holes that um, yeah, well it's to do with the displacement map on on my carpet and I probably need to get my um, carpet and um, I might want to go to a hundred by a hundred so it's got a super high dense and so if I render again now alright so those those ripples are starting to disappear but because it is a plane and not anything with thickness um, that's that's where my issue is starting to happen but if I get closer to my floorboards and I render that we should see that every now and again there's going to be a little bit of a bump or a raise and it starts to feel more like a real surface. With, with this um, it really is too glossy so I'm going to holy manoli um, get that and wind it down so it's not plastic laminated floor. I might even come to that and let's just turn it off for the meantime and I render one more time yeah look at that that you know that's some nice feeling wood I'm going to come to my carpet texture and I'll turn the displacement off that for the meantime I might want to come back to here and with the displacement it's only displacing 10 centimeters what if I make it a 50 centimeter displacement I should start to um, create a bit of chaos for myself but then again thinking about the number of divisions on my queue you know the res resolution of everything needs to sit nice I'm probably not going to get a result that I like so let's let's keep that for the moment and render. Carpet has ah oh yes, because I think I just um, no that's fine displacement. Uh, that's unusual. Maybe I'll just make my height displacement zero and put that back. Again, I haven't restarted my computer for a really long time. Let's get to my matte floor, which is on my floor 
and you see that's been made a is that's still a generative object mm -hmm. so let's say that I'm going to go 20 by 20 by 20 and in fact it's Y and Z so 1 and 200 by 200 so I've made it again a really high def mesh and I ah yes and if I render now my carpet's going to disappear again because it's the displacement that's happening on the floor the whole floor has gone jump so let's get the displacement on that and I'll turn that off and we should see that the next time I render the carpet is back so as we can see it's starting to look like a, a great little space um, but I'm more interested in the cuteness of the isometric world so everybody let's let's just have a quick chat about rendering George, Cynthia, Lennon, mm. all right, so where I'm at now, I got, a, I got a few lights, I got a few textures, it's, it's starting to maybe be okay, um, I might want to put a couple of folds or a few dings into the polygons uh, that, that make up my carpet and this is entirely up to me, but just just to go forward a little bit more if I come to this um, clapper board with a cog um, that's my render setting so this in, uh, is a medium size non one hour long length chat about settings and parameters um, the renderer that I'm using is the physical renderer and that means it calculates light as to how light works in this world um, when I come to output um, here I have my resolution so if I'm going to go for a um, I'm going to my presets drop down button if I'm going for um, a standard HD um, 1920 1080 um, at 25 frames per second now if we come down here we have this thing called resolution so um, some of us have interests in two-dimensional results on paper or two-dimensional results on screens um, or um, other such things because when I render for a TV it's 72 dpi but if I'm looking at my smartphone, imagining this is my smartphone, the, the screen resolution is 144 dpi. So that means I can go for a different size. But also in my previews, um, I could say that I'm going to print this out at A0 at 300 dpi. So I can use this to make posters if I wanted. Why, why do my graphic design just in Adobe products when I can actually make them 3D isometric madnesses. Um, the render time will be long and the file will be large but it will be something of your own because who's tried to make 3D things in Illustrator before? It's, it's a little bit heartbreaking. So um, let's, let's just leave that alone. Going to come back to um, HDTV25. So that's all good. Um, film aspect ratios and all those things we don't need to worry about but when we're making animation more than one frame we need a number of frames obviously so we usually start at frame number zero mm. we sometimes start at frame number zero and if my animation is going to be one second long it, it's going to go to frame 25 now people's attention spans aren't that short yet um, so maybe it's going to be a um, 30 second animation so that means I'm going up to 750 frames 
uh, and that's pretty straightforward. I'd need to make sure that in my project settings that my frame rate is matching. Because at the moment the frame rate of my um, project is 30 frames per second. That's, that's the program default. So it would be better to do this. And some of the things that I do, I render out at 120 frames per second and then I slow it down to 25 because of the nature of what I'm trying to do and that's a conversation for later. The save button allows me to say where I'm rendering. So let's go to week three. I'm going to make a folder called um, renders and I will call this test um, number one. Should we also do a test right Yeah, yeah, because that's what your homework is. Yeah, get some, get your modelling finished, get your scene textured, get your scene lit, and do a really nice render. And if you want to um, beef it up in Photoshop with some levels and curves, you're allowed to do that. Um, my format is, I, I have a whole stink load of formats if I'm just making an animation. I'd probably do a preview as a MP4, but um, Move has a higher quality. But if I'm doing something for broadcast, this is the important thing, I don't export a movie. I export a series of TIFF images because TIFF can allow for super HDR images, really high dynamic ranges, and then I'd be getting sequences of TIFFs and putting them into After Effects. And that would be an image sequence, and then I can do a whole bunch of things. So stepping more bravely towards how we work professionally as motion graphics designers. This is a recommended way to render but for today, I'm just going to make a JPEG, eight bits per channel. Um, you see, you see my world here. There's there's nothing behind it. So I could include an alpha channel, and so that when I render out the square, what isn't there is going to be actually invisible. So I could drop this into another thing, and that might have well that has use in After Effects, obviously, but it has use in all. Adobe products, but do you get an alpha channel with a JPEG? No, that's right. Oh, yes. um, PNG and um, as importantly TIFF. Um, so let's just go for PNG. PNG, is it there? Yeah. Um, oh, there it is. I was actually selecting okay. it, um, looking around the arrow, not at the arrow. Um, Multipass is when we break our image down into what each light is doing and you know how we've been looking at today the color and um, we were looking at reflections and we were looking at bumps you can render those out as separate sequences or separate images and then in photoshop and in After Effects, you can play with those a little bit more. And that's a very important part of visual effects. But this isn't about VFX pipeline. So multi-pass for us in the intents of this course is, is not needed. Um, in my options, this controls the quality of my outcome. Um, and what you want to look at is increasing ray depth and shadow depth if your image is looking noisy so the the shadows aren't a perfect gradient if they look all kind of patchy and splotchy then it's these two values that you want to be um, looking at um, if you're making something move and you want it to blur you'll be looking at motion scale but in due course then um, Stereoscopic, yes, you can render in stereo for vi um, for virtual reality purposes, so that you have a left eye and a right eye. Um, we have 
the ability to render over a network. So if you've got a whole bunch of computers um, and you have the power of evil to harness multiple machines, then you can work a lot faster. But this program has a tie-in with Google Zinc. And what Google Zinc is, is um, millions of CPU clusters online that you can send work for rendering. And if you sign up, to Google Zinc, they give you about three grand's worth of credits or a thousand dollars worth of credits, a certain amount of money that you can then suddenly go, all right, I'm gonna use 64 processors to go through this sequence. And so instead of sweating and worrying with our resources, we can use cloud computing to um, get our frames faster. Or you can do what I have and have 64 processes at home just waiting ready to go um, and several uh, well I've got about half a terabyte of RAM across two machines not about me moving along um, two effects that I always add to my renders is ambient occlusion so that you won't have in your render settings and um, global illumination because it's global illumination that makes your lighting very very good so i'm going to turn that on and i've got my general settings of my primary method as an irradiance cache and my secondary method as um, radiosity maps um, and that gives really good results and you've seen that in some of my previews but they do take a bit longer um, especially if you start making your sample count really really high and of course five or ten minutes for a single frame is fine but you got 25 of, the, of those frames for a second so to test something out you don't want it to take hours you just want to have a really basic roll through of the motion first and then you start thinking about your texturing and your lightings and the visual appeal that happens afterwards. Um, object glow I'm turning off but ambient occlusion what what that means is that if you and, and this is answering your question Felix finally uh, is that how do I get nice little shadows in the corner things to make them feel like they're not just one flowing form but separate? That's what ambient occlusion does. Um, That's a plugin. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a built-in effect. So I, I tell you what, what what I'm going to do is I'm going to step to another file. Um, I'll, I'll keep that as it is. So uh, a minor diversion. Um, not that one maybe not that one let's just go for a new file I have um, made a cube and I'm going to make a, another cube and that one is going to there yeah, so I'm just thinking about this relationship here if, if I create a, um, a light, let's just get that light and pull it up into space. It's going to be an infinite light, I'm, I'm not too worried by, by that much. And if I, if I render now, well that's what I get, yay, it, it looks like two big blocks of boring um, intersecting with each other. If I use this render to picture viewer, instead of it happening in my screen, um, it pops out, it's the same thing in a different window. What's the big deal about that? Well, you see the, the great thing is, is that I get, I get a history buffer so I can start to compare, well, shall I do it like this? Or, now I'm gonna to come to my render settings and going to go for my physical renderer um, and ray tracing engine um, i'm going to go for physical 
and I'm going to come to effect and I'm going to add top of the list ambient occlusion. So let's come back to here and I'm going to render again and there's been this nice little light fall that's been added. It, it's, it's subtle, sure, but look at the difference it makes. It brings your render more into the real world. You know, the edge around your keyboard has a little wee shadow. The edge around my laptop has a little wee shadow. And that's what ambient occlusion does. And we have controls on the minimum and maximum um, ray length, um, the colors that we're using. So it doesn't need to ambiently occlude to just black. Hang on, come here you. Making sure that it's full brightness. So if I render this out one more time, oh, that, 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 could, be, that could be quite interesting. Could be, or it could just be some trippy nonsense. Let's get that back to how it was. And um, my dispersion and my ray length, let's just take that up to, say, 500. And I render one more time. You know, there's, there's a greater spread of the darkness and um, one more go if I make my dispersion. Let's cut it first. Not much choice, change I should say. Let's make it 400%. Oh, I can't take it above 100. And we can see that there are you know, there's quite a spread going on there, a different color, and it's all better than that, which is just really, really dull and boring. So that's what ambient occlusion does. Coming, coming back to my real file, let's just close that for the second. Um, global illumination means how things emit light and how light bounces off off objects so if you wanted a um, crystal goblet filled with red red wine that had a candle and then it's making the little ripply red light on the tablecloth so you're at some kind of fancy restaurant you'd be using global illumination and, and, and we can go into this at a greater depth further into the semester. So we have presets for our global illumination which are um, useful to start with and so if I go with interior high and I'm going to come to my physical um, renderer and go for a real physical setting, quick preview um, don't need to worry about that because that's what I'm doing inside the screen. Um, what I'm going to use now is my proper render to picture viewer. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to frame up my shot a bit better. So it's not complete. I haven't added a texture to my poster frame yet. Uh, Let's stop that and I'm rendering to my picture viewer. So it's calculator, it's calculating how light will scatter amongst my scene. Um, and then it's starting to think about So it takes a little while. It might be a minute or two. This is why we spend big money on our... Ah, oh, right. Um, now, what I had done is I had set a range of um, frames, so from 0 to 750, 
and it's actually rendering out that sequence. So I've started a render I didn't really need to. Um, if I want to cancel a render, I can either hit the cancel key or if I close this window, um, it will ask me, do I really want to stop the render? But before I actually do that, another advantage that this program has on top of um, Maya, as well as being able to open more than one project at a time, is that I could potentially come back here and if my computer was grunty enough, and it isn't, it's a Mac, um, I could keep working while it's also rendering. So that means with my renderer I can say, all right, processes 16 to 32, I can use over here and processes 0 to um, 15, I will use for my modeling purposes. Uh, so I'm going to close that and it says, you really want to stop doing this? And yes, I do. And so my render has been cancelled however and because I've been rendering out individual frames I do have my renders folder and um, test ISO um, 40s PNG is, is, is right there it would be great to see if my transparency channel has come through so which um, it, it all depends how you render it so if I rendered it as a movie right now it would just be it would be nothing because it, the, the end of the video file hasn't been hasn't been written mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a total waste of time so rendering out stills means that if your machines sick or slow you can stop the render at a particular frame and all the frames leading up to that are great now also if you render out frames and this is a recommendation is that um, as you know you guys can log into more than one machine at a time right you can log into the whole lab oh yes you can so if we think about 1080 if you're the last person in the building here at nine o'clock at night, you can log into all the machines and say, all right, this machine is gonna render frames one to 100, 101 to 200, and so you can get the whole lab to crunch um, you know, 2,000 frames overnight if you wanna spend that half an hour just logging in, setting, 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 and setting. And, that's normally what students do. Um, it's back when I was a student, people were coming in here, you know, you'd have a spot booked between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. for rendering. And if you were late, someone would take your seat. And at quarter to four in the morning, someone's going, could you hurry up? I need to do my rendering. I need to. But that was before, I mean, this was, 1998 before you guys were born and and oh you're way before security and way before processes were fast as well um, so let's open up this final PNG file and as you can see I have a alpha channel burnt straight in so I, I could I could drop you know any color I want behind it or it could I don't know what happens next because I haven't finished the work. Mm -hmm. Questions? No? Anyone confused about what is expected of them? Okay, then go gently into the weekend. You have work to do in this class and I hear in some others, including studio, third years. Um, and I will uh, stop recording and once this is processed 2 hours 23 minutes